Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night, and some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. Bump in the Night 2 – Carver's Revenge by Scott Donnelly I sat there on the couch, watching TV and eating a snack. The storm outside had put to rest my plans of playing outside with my friends, so this was the next best thing – eating chips and watching Jurassic Park. A blast of thunder from outside ripped my attention away from the TV, and I sat up on the couch. Storms didn't really bother me much, being from the Midwest I was used to them. But ever since we moved to California for my dad's job, the storms seemed different. My mom said it was just because I was homesick, but I wasn't so sure about that. My dad said it was due to the ocean being so close that the storms could gather more energy. I wasn't a weather buff, so I couldn't confirm nor deny my dad's theory either. All I knew was that, for me, California storms were far scarier than the ones in the heart of the country. My dad crossed the living room in a hurry, tossing on his raincoat and putting the hood over his head. I saw he had his car keys in his hands. "'Where are you going?' I asked him, confused as to what would possess him to leave in the middle of the storm on his only day off this week. He turned to me. "'Work,' he said. "'They're having an issue that they need me for. I'll seriously only be about ten minutes there, then I'll be home." I didn't know what my dad did for work. I'd asked a couple of times, but for some reason my parents kept the nature of his job a secret. I had been curious, though. All I did know was that it had to do with mechanics or something. "'Can I come?' I asked, thinking maybe it would distract me from the storm. He removed his hood. Uh, "'They don't really allow kids inside the building.' he said to me. I stood up, still hopeful. I can stay in the car, I said to him. I just don't want to… Another loud boom of thunder shook the house, making me jump. My dad faced the TV where a fictional storm was crashing down on the dinosaurs in the movie. He looked at me and smirked. Fine, he said. Get your raincoat. I'll go tell your mother. I did as he said, excited to finally see where my dad worked. Well, the outside of the building, at least. Within the next few minutes, we were in his car, driving through Los Angeles County. Across the city, my dad pulled into a large, gated parking lot where a long, brick warehouse was situated. Through the falling rain, I scoured the outside of the building, the fences, and a small guard shack at the entrance where we'd come in. But I couldn't find the company's name. "'You're a mechanic?' I asked him. I looked over at my dad behind the wheel and saw him smirk again. Uh, sort of, he said. He turned to me. I fix things. Once again, he decided to keep his profession very vague. I started to wonder if my dad was a hitman and fixed things by, well, eliminating the problem. We parked close to the brick building, right outside a door that read Area 5. My dad made sure the parking brake was on and then looked at me. Stay here, okay, pal? I'll be back in about ten minutes and then we'll head home." I nodded. Sure. With that, my dad left the car and hurried through the rain, opening the door and disappearing inside the building. I took a deep breath and looked around the lot. There weren't many cars in the lot to begin with, so I wondered if this was most people's day off from the job. I turned on the radio and scanned the stations, trying to find a good song, but the storm was interfering with the reception. Everything was coming in as static. I turned the radio off and looked back out the window toward the door my dad had gone in. My heart sank. The door was open and someone stood within the doorframe. They looked tall, 
and were wearing a long, flowing black robe with their face obscured by shadows within the hood. In their hand, I noticed a long, grim reaper-style scythe. Whoever it was was staring right at me, and then out of nowhere two red eyes lit up in the darkness of his face. I swallowed hard, watching the grim reaper just gawk at me. Then, without warning, he removed his foot from the bottom of the door and let it shut on him, sealing him in the building where my dad had just went. I grew nervous and my heart began to beat faster. That's when my brain made the connection and I recognized the shadowy creeper. Carver! Christopher Carver, to be exact! He had been punished by his classmates and hung up in a corn maze where he disappeared overnight, only to return for revenge ten years later. But what was he doing here and why? It didn't make any logical sense to me. Actually, it was impossible. Thoughts of my dad meeting the business end of that scythe began to race through my head, and I knew I had to do something about it. I had to help my dad, warn him or get him out of there before Carver made his move. I turned the car off and took the keys with me as I dashed through the pouring rain and crashing thunder. I flung open the Area 5 door and let it shut behind me. I was staring down a long, empty hallway. Silence surrounded me. Even the rain outside was muffled by the heavy door and thick brick walls. I took a few steps forward, my shoes squeaking on the floor. I wanted to call out for my dad, but I had no idea where he was. Suddenly Carver crossed the hall up ahead of me and disappeared into another room. I gasped and ducked into the closest room. I closed the door quietly and flipped on the light switch. The room lit up. I turned around and couldn't believe my eyes. There were skeletons everywhere, laying on the floor, hanging from the rafters, secured to the wall. I'd stumbled into Carver's lair, a dumping ground for his victims. I screamed as loud as I could and flung the door back open. I ran into the hall, still screaming. I looked down the long corridor and watched as a man poked his head out from one of the rooms. When he saw me, he stepped out into the hallway, and I noticed it was a police officer. Are you okay? How'd you get in here? The officer asked. Uh, there, there, are, there are dead bodies in that room! I shouted at him while frantically pointing to Carver's lair. <laughs> what? The officer questioned with a laugh. Look, I, I don't think you... But before he could finish his sentence, Carver appeared behind him in the hallway. My eyes widened. Look out behind you! The officer turned around and was face to face with Carver, his red eyes glowing menacingly beneath his hood. Suddenly, Carver lifted his scythe into the air, but I didn't wait around to see the messy aftermath. I bolted into the next room and slammed the door shut. That's when I heard the officer scream out in the hallway. Th th this can't be happening, I tried to convince myself. I ran through a cluttered room of boxes and crates and exploded through another door and into a dark room with red lights hanging above me. This place was like a nightmare come to life. Another door opened, and Carver stepped into the room, his scythe blade glinting under the red lights. No! I screamed at him, and then kept running. I found another door labeled Exit and pushed my way through. I ended up in another, large, dark room that was leaking from above. The rain from outside must have been too much for the old roof. I stepped through the room, feeling soft dirt and mud beneath my feet. What was this? I tripped and fell into a large, flat stone sticking out of the mud. I braced myself on it and pushed myself away just enough to see it was a gravestone. My eyes widened and my stomach felt sick. A flash of light from above briefly lit up the room, which was a full-blown graveyard with rolling hills, rows of headstones, and Carver. Another flash of lightning outlined Carver's appearance again. He stood on one of the rolling hills between two gravestones and held his scythe in the air. I screamed as loud as I could. Then a man's voice shouted, Cut! With this one demanding word, the rain stopped falling and the lights in the room all turned on, blinding me at first. But when my eyes adjusted, I looked around at the confusing sight. There were people all over the place, strategically hidden around the graveyard. Carver, standing in the center of the space, lowered his scythe and then his hood. I saw the innocent face of a twenty-something-year-old man. "'How'd you get on my set?' a man's voice said. 
It was the same voice that demanded cut moments earlier. I turned and saw a middle-aged man with a beard and mustache jogging over to me. When I saw him, I immediately recognized him from the horror magazines I secretly read behind my parents' back. It was Wes Hitchcock, the horror movie director who had made Bump in the Night. Wait! I said, looking around. The graveyard. Carver, the red eyes. I was on a movie set! Wait, is this Bump in the Night too? I asked. Wes Hitchcock came up to me and placed his hands on his hips. Yes, he said, kind of annoyed. Carver's Revenge and you are... That's Johnny Boy, another voice said. I turned around and saw a second Carver hurrying up to me, removing his hood and glowing red eyeglasses. Behind him was the police officer I thought he had eliminated. Now in the large scope of knowing where I was, I recognized the officer as Billy Nelson, an actor who I'd seen in about five different movies. The second Carver came up to me and turned to Hitchcock. Johnny came in to fix the mechanical hand and said his son was out in the car. I looked outside to make sure he was okay out there by himself. When I noticed him slip into the building, I decided to just play a little harmless prank on him, he said, alluding to when he had raised the scythe on Officer Billy Nelson. This is why I don't like kids on the set. It's not a child-friendly environment, Hitchcock said. This is an R-rated feature film, people. Um, I shyly muttered. Don't tell my dad, but I've seen Bump in the Night about a dozen times. Hitchcock let his frustrations dissipate, and then he smirked. I bet you have. You're not the first kid to sneak and watch a scary movie behind their parents' back, and you definitely won't be the last. I then heard the unmistakable sound of my dad clearing his throat behind me. I slowly turned around, knowing he had just heard what I had told Mr. Hitchcock. He stood there with a mechanical prop hand in his grip, its fingers squirming robotically and squirting fake blood from exposed wires at its open wrist. "'You've watched Bump in the Night?' he questioned me, vibes of shock and surprise in his voice. I gulped nervously and could do nothing but nod. "'And you liked it?' I shyly nodded again. Then my dad smirked then you're going to love part two. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, visit our website at microterrors.com where you can get the latest Micro Terrors news, read fun facts about each story, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you can become one of the terrified by joining the fan club at microterrors.com to enjoy exclusive perks like reading stories a week early, receiving complimentary books, and communicating directly with Micro Terrors writer and creator Scott Donnelly. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram using the handle at microterrors. I hope you'll join us again soon for Micro Terrors, scary stories for kids.